Hello and welcome back to Bookish. Uh, it's a really good, fun day for me today. Today is the first video I'm making for our read-along of William Faulkner's uh, Light in August. And I'm really kind of excited to get into this in a way that's, um, you know, practically giddy. Nothing like, you know, sharing an author that you, you like a, a, a lot, hopefully, with, with people who watch your videos and then even more hopefully with people who have decided to read along. So, you know, we just set out... Um, chapter one to be the reading for this first like three-day week in August just to kind of get it started. So it's just chapter one today that I'm going to be talking about so this shouldn't be very long and then every Saturday after that either Alan or I or both of us will have a video up that covers five more chapters uh, which is going to be you know for every week around 110 or 110 or more pages per week. So it's nice to get started with just this kind of a little short uh, introductory chapter into, into Light in August. So uh, this chapter just basically you know, outlines the basic beginning of the story uh, in which Lena Grove uh, is pregnant uh, by a man who's essentially skipped town, uh, said he'd send word for her, never does. She's obviously fairly far along in her pregnancy and she decides to go in search of him. She leaves Alabama and she goes to Mississippi where she finds her way to Jefferson, Mississippi, the county seat of Faulkner's famous fictional Yoknapatawpha County. Um, and along the way, she runs into uh, people who are willing to help her, women who are willing to help her, even though they don't want to associate with her. Uh, there are a couple of things in here I just thought were, were kind of um, interesting, and, and one reason why I like just having one chapter here. You kind of get a chance to get used to Faulkner's use of language, um, the richness of his sentences, his habit of sometimes mashing words together that aren't really words to convey uh, the meaning that he has, um, his the uh, colloquial pronunciations that you find, the language that the characters use, the, even the cadence of their language. And, you know, I, I think I mentioned this to somebody in a comment, Faulkner's novels just speak to me because... They just feel like the South that uh, I grew up in uh, and know something about. So uh, Lena is in search of her child's uh, father. Uh, his last name is Birch, and she learns, or believes she's learned, that he's in Jefferson City working at a planing mill. Um, along the way, she runs into uh, people who tell her, no, that guy's last name is Bunch. But she's convinced Birch is there anyway, and she goes on. I think it's interesting that as Lena approaches um, Jefferson City in the distance, there are there's a house fire going on as she uh, comes into town because she and the events that surround her are certainly um, going to create uh, um, problems in and around uh, Jefferson City. So. A couple of things about this that struck me, and you know, you can spend a lot of time if you want to looking at the symbolism of all the things that go on and all the illusions that are made. I was talking to Alan, Alan about this the other day. I have a tendency to just let the text wash over me and through me uh, <clears throat> and to count on, you know, myself and the author working together to pick up on the illusions that are, that are most important. But I think it's interesting to notice how here in Faulkner's world, it's the men who are most likely to look kindly on Lena. And while the only woman she runs into treats her kindly, she also clearly doesn't want her in her house for a long period of time. And it's likely that, you know, Armstead is in a little bit of trouble for bringing him to his home in the first place. Also, you might notice that Lena says she doesn't want to be beholden to people. She doesn't want to be beholden for a ride. She doesn't want to be beholden for meals made to her. And yet she accepts uh, these acts of charity uh, all along the way. I made a video about William Faulkner in social class in which I talked about the fact, uh, and I used As I Lay Dying as an example, of how the social class who sometimes were referred to as poor white trash, that is, poor white Southerners who didn't own any land, who were the poorest of the poor, uh, oftentimes uh, tried to keep a pride of class, of separating themselves in a racist way for African Americans by not seeming to beg or accept charity. And you see that reflected um, in Lena's behavior and also at the same time in the lower Southern classes, the landed Southern classes, willingness to extend charity up to a point 
of maintaining the class distinctions and being disapproving on a moral ground of Lena and what's happened to her. So one of the things that, that you know has come up in, in, in all this discussion about Faulkner that I've been doing on my channel is why do I like Faulkner so much? And it, well, what occurred to me is the similarity oftentimes between Faulkner and Balzac. And maybe the reason I like Balzac so much is that he reminds me of Faulkner. This story about a poor uh, young person going to a city, in Faulkner's case, it's Jefferson City, but in Balzac's case, it's oftentimes Paris, under difficult circumstances with all kinds of moral questions coming up. Uh, really, those two, that kind of idea really for the first time just occurred to me that there is a connection, a similarity between Faulkner and, uh, between Faulkner, between Faulkner and Balzac. Anyway, my dog is chewing something up right now. I hope you enjoyed chapter one, and I hope that that's convinced you to go on to read chapters uh, two through six, which we'll be covering in videos next weekend. Anyway, let me know what you thought about chapter one. Let me know what you think about Faulkner's writing style in the comment section below. And as always, thank you for watching.